If the panelists will come on stage, uh, please join me now. And I think we can have everybody introduce themselves. I'd love to hear in your own words. Um, let's say your name, what you do, and also what originally spurred your activism. You're all here for that reason. Um, Tatiana, do you want to start at the end? Sure. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so, okay, so my name is Tatiana. I'm a PhD student at the CUNY Grad School, um, and I teach at Hunter. And um, I think I was always like pretty left, pretty progressive, um, and certainly like being queer and Latina in the US, um, like was already um, something that, that made me think about my life kind of politically and my identities really politically. And then I ended up moving to, to Brazil uh, when I was uh, in my late 20s. And, um, and that's when I, I was thinking a lot about, well, what is the way forward? How, how can we, um, how can we really, really change society at the root? Um, and that's when I, I, I came to Marxism, to socialism, when I was living in Brazil. Um, and uh, joined a socialist organization there and um, have really been thinking about uh, queerness and queer liberation from a socialist lens since. Awesome, thank you. Cool, please. <laughs> Hello, my name is uh, Andreas, Andreas Günther. Um, I live in New York since last August, before I have been living in Berlin for 25 years. Um, I was born in uh, Dresden, grew up in a little town, in a, in a small town in East Germany, uh, and um, I joined uh, activism after the fall of the wall, in a way that the, the fall of the wall was really connected with my coming out, and so um, after quite a disappointment about what I was told that socialism was, I was still left and uh, I uh, tried to find a way and I tried to combine, of course, this coming out with uh, left activism. And I was active in the Party of Democratic Socialism as head of the queer group, later in the Linke. Um, now I'm working here in New York as uh, director of the Office of the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, that's a German left wing political foundation, which I'm not representing tonight, I'm just representing myself. Um, yeah, that's uh, how I started my activism. Awesome, thank you. And Alex? Yeah, my name is Alex Mendes. I'm from Mexico. Uh, I'm a lawyer. So I'm the director of litigation of Mexico Igualitario. That is a project that is specialized on legal strategies to defend LGBTQ rights in Mexico. Um, I have lived in Mexico by like um, seven years, but actually I was born in Oaxaca. And this is important because um, the activism in Oaxaca is totally different than uh, Mexico City. So I have the, I think that uh, we are trying to build a national movement since another perspective that is not uh, what we have in Mexico City now. So I think that we need to hear some other voices that are facing discrimination in hard scenarios in Mexico too. So thank you. Awesome, and Puebla. Hi, my name is Puebla Dier. I'm from Montreal, Canada. And these three are the reason why I didn't want to be part of this panel. <laughs> Such bright and uh, talented individuals. Um, so I'm basically uh, now an old boy about town. Um, that's what I was starting at 13 years old. I came from a very abusive family. Um, I ventured out well, I started running away from home um, at seven years old and finally left when I was 13. Um, being queer was, I was always known that I was queer and used the word queer for myself before it became a queer studies moniker. Um, and now I actually don't even know what queer means anymore. Um, and um, so I was a sex worker, um, as you I was a sex worker and I traveled the world from about 13 to 19. It's quite extraordinary. It was the 70s and the 80s. You could do that then. Um, and then uh, I moved to Montreal 
And I followed a bunch of really hot looking guys going all in the same direction. And they happened to be going to the fifth annual AIDS conference that was taking place in Montreal. And that was a pivotal conference because that's where we stormed the stage or I ended up being swept up in the wave because HIV people wanted a place at the table and that happened in Montreal. And we stormed the stage on the then Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. And I was, as I was saying earlier, that was my first indication that uh, the government wasn't really there to protect me. And then the following, so that was in 89, and then in 1990 we had an event called Sex Garage, which was this just wild uh, event uh, with all kinds of kids and all kinds of people uh, partying that was busted by the police very violently. And then that was my indication that the police weren't there to protect me. Um, and somehow I ended up doing campus and community radio station, even though I only had grade seven education and suddenly I'm doing a show called The Homo Show. And then that led me to uh, co-found uh, what's now uh, Montreal's modern pride movement with an event called Diversité. And I also got involved in comedy and started uh, a queer comedy show at uh, the Just for Laughs Festival in Montreal, which is a world-renowned festival, and I was at sort of the forefront of queer comedy. And um, now I'm just old and take a back seat and write plays every once in a while and, and uh, and I've been blessed to be invited by uh, the Goethe Institute, and I'm thrilled to be here. Awesome, thank you. Let's jump into the session. We have seen massive changes to the global political climate in the last few years. You mentioned doing some work in Brazil, Brazil, the US, other places. How have these changes made you rethink your work and think about what you want to accomplish? Who wants to start? Are you looking at me? <laughs> we talked earlier. I think they're looking at me. No, um, I mean, I think it's clear that there's a lot of urgency right now. The rights that were won are being taken away. Um, I think just in the US, uh, we see even the right to an abortion uh, certainly being challenged. Um, in Brazil, also, uh, you know, the rise of Bolsonaro in the US, the rise of Trump. Um, that have emboldened uh, a right wing um, that, uh, that, that certainly is uh, attacking uh, LGBT folks, but also other sectors of oppressed people. Um, I think that in combination with uh, the, you know, the climate crisis, I think uh, gives us, at least gives me, a real sense of urgency, right? Um, to think about um, how to, uh, to, to fight back against uh, these right-wing movements, um, to connect uh, movements to each other, and to think about, um, you know, I think a theme in the panel is resistance, but also not just resistance, not like how do we win, right? How do we build a different kind of society? How do we build a sustainable kind of society? Um, and so I think that that's why, to me, um, the discussion about socialism is, is really important. And I think that that's the other thing that's sort of heartening in this moment, is that it's not just that we see a rise of the right, but even in the US, we see a whole new generation of people, of young people, who are like, hmm, maybe socialism, right? Um, and I think that that's interesting, you know? I, I think it's, it, there's, there's a polarization um, happening in the US and around the world. Uh, the right is, is quite organized and has, has been able to win. Um, I think it's our task to think about, well, you know, how can we also be organized and how can we also, how can we win? And, and that's pretty new, that the right, that the opposition, is well organized, right? Or, or is, is that, you, you give me a face, what do you think about that, Paula? <laughs> do you disagree? Uh, yes. Uh, is this, do I need to use this? Please, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I think they've always been well organized. I just think that they've been uh, given people, in, uh, that people have been put into positions of power that have given them the room to say and do things that pro might not have been permitted a few years ago. 
Um, and then with great success comes the, the rebuttal. So I don't, I, I think they've always been organized and I think this is just uh, continued growth of a, of a concerted effort to, um, you know, these things don't just happen in a vacuum. They, they, they build over time and years and these, these, uh, these abortion things that have been happening in the United States, they don't happen in a bubble. They've, people have been working steadily and progressively to get these things done. So I don't, I don't think it's new. I think it's actually uh, what we're seeing now is, is the culmination of years and years of organizing. Do you agree with that, Alex? Oh, well, I think it's that um, for many years, conservative movements didn't need to be organized uh, because all the institutions in the state, all the social institutions too, um, are built in order to continue with the discrimination. So they didn't need a movement because all the state, all the institutions are the movement. All the ideology um, behind the state is that um, what they only need. When we start to have our victories to defend our rights, it's when, when I think they discovered that if they want to continue that ideology, that they need to be organized. And now they are answering. Uh, so they didn't need it before. And now they need it because we, are, uh, or we have some victories uh, for our rights too, I think. May, may I just say also that it's not only that they become organized, it's that we become disenfranchised, um, in my humble opinion. Um, we're at each other in a way that we haven't been in a long time, so that's opened the door for the neocons to take up more space. And, and you were seeing that in Canada, where you live? No, I mean, the thing with Canada is that we're your neighbors, and and the New York Times, it's not for nothing that they do a, a, like a Canadian edition, because Canadians are actually really interested in what happens around the world, um, according to the New York Times editor. That's why they do a New York a Canadian edition. Um, and so we kind of look at, it's, we have this window into what happens down here. And I think, so we're just kind of like, your little brothers and sisters up north, just kind of checking out what's going on down there and taking what's, you know, and the neocons in our country observe and become part and build uh, based on things that are happening down here. It's, so far, not quite at the same level, but there's a rise in, you know, we have Doug Ford in Ontario, and I don't know if you know about Doug Ford, but he had this like crazy crackhead brother who died, Rob Ford. Um, anyway, and uh, the Raptors won. I don't know if anybody follows basketball, but and he's a neocon and destroying like everything that's been built by Kathleen Wynne, who was the uh, Dyke Premier of Ontario for many many years, and did some great progressive stuff, some horrible stuff, but some great stuff. And Doug Ford has begun to decimate. Um, all of that progressive stuff in, in swoops, in swoops. Anyway, the Raptors won, and he got booed so loudly um, because people woke up and they're like, oh, wait a minute, that means my education, you know. Anyway. Andreas, you look lost in thought. Well, I'm still thinking about uh, the question, is it, is it really new, uh, uh, what, is, what, what is going on? I, I think it's, um, in a way, it is an, uh, um, a rollback I expected a, a bit, uh, because um, it seemed for a while, so I think I, I know the, the situation is, is different everywhere in the world, but uh, let's see, and I, let's, let me talk for Germany. In Germany, it seemed for a while that we had like a cultural hegemony, hegemony of, of uh, well, progressive thinking, at least le left liberal thinking. And, um, but that didn't mean that the other thoughts vanished. They, are, they were still there. A friend of mine once talked about um, oh, uh, li living room fascism. So that, that's what you, that, or 
or kitchen fishes and what you don't say in public but you openly say on your kitchen table or in your living room and that never that never vanished and um, now they feel uh, many people feel um, feel encouraged to say what they always thought and uh, not only to say but also to do that I actually just had some uh, Days, some weeks ago, uh, a murder in Germany on a politician, done obviously by a right-wing extremist, uh, who obviously was work probably was working alone, but uh, felt obviously encouraged by this changing atmosphere. So, yeah, the, the shift was there, but the, the, the roots are deeper, I think. And when you say that you're not surprised by this pushback, that you expected it, I think that, you know, to that uh, correlation, we're seeing a rise in homophobia and transphobia around the world. And I wonder if that is just a necessary hump in the movement, like that is to be expected and um, we can move past it. Like, for example, in America, we're seeing a lot of anti-trans legislation. And one of the reasons why we're seeing that recently is that people on the whole are just starting to figure out that trans is a thing, right? 20 years ago, people probably couldn't define transgender. And still, 84% of the population in America doesn't know a trans person. So um, we're then seeing legislation against this new, with quotes, population that people are just learning about. So, uh, so, so my, my, my question is, like these, these pushbacks and the rollbacks, is it just part of the grand plan? If I may, I, I sometimes think maybe we have been too quickly, too successful, uh, and we did not realize that, uh, so let's say that it sounds a bit weird, but the, the ordinary people cannot follow us <laughs> in their thoughts and, and they understand that. We, we, we got a, a legal, ex, legal tolerance and equal rights in a way, but not really a deep threat acceptance in the population. And I guess I, I my image is good enough to experience that. Of course. And I, I guess like the pushback to that is like you're saying like we're moving a bit too fast to the population when like I think we need so much more on top of that. Tatiana, I see you uh no shake your head. <laughs> um I think that um, I think that we should think about like, well, why the rise of the right and why now, you know? Um, and I think that uh, at least in the U.S. and I would certainly say in Brazil and and we can think about in other countries. I can't speak to the world, um, but I think that there was something important that happened in 2008 with the economic crisis. I think that um, there was a sort of breaking of the sort of, uh, you know, the, the political parties that had always been like neoliberal hegemony, the idea that like things are just going to keep going along like this like forever and we can just keep doing this forever and, and, and uh, this idea of the sort of linearity, the end of history, right, as uh, Fukuyama would put it. And I think that 2008 really broke that. and. Um, and even politicians like Obama, right? Um, people voted for him, hope and change. Um, but then, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter happened during the Obama administration. Uh, there were people thought hope and change, but you know, black folks were still being killed by cops um, and still being locked up at alarming rates. Um, and uh, you had Occupy Wall Street also during the Obama administration. Um, and I think that there was a sort of um, the, the polarization that happened um, happened as, in part, in large part, as a result of a breaking of this, you know, sort of neoliberal hegemony that, that had been so prevalent during the 90s. Um, and I think that, that certainly in Brazil, you know, um, the, there are tons of people who voted for Bolsonaro, and some of them are super homophobic and transphobic, and some of them aren't. Some of them were just like, you know, uh, like, I'm against corruption, and uh, he speaks out against corruption. I, you know, obviously, like, the, the level of wrong that they are is, is really high, but um, I think that, 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 you know, people are, 
when people are upset and angry and they look at their lives and they're like, this is fucked up, you know, um, that can be a really, that can be the basis for a polarization, for, for a, a radicalization to the left or to the right. And the, the right was more organized. Um, so I, I think that I would explain it in that way. I, I, Andre, so going back to what you said, I think that's a really important point that I don't want to gloss over, that many people feel like we're moving too fast. And whether or not we agree with them, they still feel that. And so we need to somehow address that concern, whether or not we judge it to be valid or not, it, we still need to address that and yet somehow still continue to like gain more rights and privilege. Do you disagree? Um, let me just uh, connect the, the things what Tatiana said, because I think that's important, that um, this rise of the right is, is a part of, of, of the prevalence of the neoliberalism in the last, it started basically as, as the good time in Chile, and with Reaganomics and Thatcherism in, in Great Britain, and uh, what the Schroeder government did in Germany, and so on, and so on. And, uh, um, the, the reason why people now are leaning to the right is that um, the classic social democratic uh, um, center left also did neoliberal politics. And people are now getting now aware that it's not true this triggering down, nothing is triggering down from, from, uh, from above, uh, but uh, they are losing. Uh, the real income on the lower classes is shrinking since years. And um, so, um, not that they are really already uh, marginalized, but they are in fear of being marginalized. And they combine that all this, this idea that are all these new times, this globalization, this uh, insecurity of, of living, and those gender and those queer stuff, that's all this modern liberal thing. And uh, well, and they, they mixed it all up, I think, in a way. And so, um, and they, had to, they want to have security. They, they want, it's all going too far. People want, want to have security, and that's why they are going to those guys who, who uh, promise them that there is something like a security inside the national borders, building a nice wall, uh, rising tariffs on imports, and so on and so on. That's the point. And I think we, if, we, if you want to address that, I think we have to address it all in, in, in a combination of, of all, and to, to make clear who, is the, who are the good guys. No, you don't have to. Well, you know, capitalism is broken. Uh, the shrinking of the middle class, uh, the classic fear of the other. Um, why are they getting it all? Um, all of those things combined together: the fear of immigration, the fear of of uh, you said it, uh, the, the walls going up, like. All of these things combined together create this this populist uh, this populist growth that you know I mean the slogan itself for Trump was "Make America Great Again," and it's kind of a classic political neocon. I mean I don't have the same language, but the same kind of uh, the same kind of thing worldwide. They're using all of the same classic neocon borderline fascist um, tools to have populations um, um, somebody help me? Um, I just try to think of the answer because uh, when I analyze what is happening in Mexico now it's very difficult to, to say just one answer as we was talking we have 32 different laws about uh, marriage in Mexico. So we, do, we, if we want to win the right to get married in other country, we don't have to fight just one battle. There are 32 different battles. So even though <laughs> I think that we have a lot of victories to, to celebrate. So 
I don't think, maybe I'm very optimist what is happening in Mexico, <laughs> but with the, when we change the strategies to fight against the law, uh, we are creating or building another way to connect with the, with the government and with uh, the social movements, with our social movements. So, for example, I think about uh, a young woman, a trans, uh, woman, trans man that we are representing to get their documents. Um, he was afraid to go to the, uh, his um, graduation in the school because uh, he don't have his paper with, or his documents. Um, and we tried, we organized a legal strategy to protect him, and he was able to stay in his uh, celebration with his name that he has um, taken. So when we want this kind of battles, we connect with, in a different way with the, the government and with the social movements. Because the director of the school was the only one who was against uh, to use his name. But all the, the teachers and his uh, friends in the school was agreeing with that. So we need to change this. You know, so in Mexico, there are a lot of scenarios. It's, we don't have only one answer to this. Yeah. I think that's great. And before this, you were explaining about the fight for same-sex marriage in Mexico, how it's, it's about marriage, but it's about like the larger movement building. Do you mind speaking about that here? I think it's so important. Yeah. Um, always uh, people ask me why we are fighting for gay marriage or same-sex marriage in Mexico. Because there are a lot of things, and very important things, like trans identity, some crimes, uh, and all other things. And what I say is that we need to organize a national movement because we don't have it. So, and if we don't have that organization, we can uh, fight for other rights. So same-sex marriage is just like an excuse to organize us, to fight uh, together uh, against the new conservative movements. So it's important because many couples want to get married and they have the right to do it. But for us, like Mexico Alitario knows that it's not the meaning goal for us. So we just try to organize to have just one goal to fight together. And it's the reason that we are fighting for uh, same-sex marriage. And did you steal that strategy from like the US or another country, seeing like this movement building and uh, putting it around marriage equality? Is that something you like, saw it elsewhere around the world? Yeah, uh, the important thing for, for us is to change the strategies. So we uh, learned that political strategies like just uh, work with politicians or political party was not enough for us. So we tried to work with the legal strategy and when we start to work with judges and the Supreme Court, it was very different because we know that the only thing that we uh, need to have to connect with our rights is not a lawyer, but just to a lawsuit, it was enough. Uh, for example, um, in Nuevo León, that is in, state, in one state in the north of Mexico, um, the new conservative movement um, got, got like um, 32,000 signs against the gay marriage. But when our lawsuit, we are, we were able to get married for the couple. So in one hand, in one hand we have 22,000 signs, but in the other hand we have like a trial with a judgment, and that's it. We just need the justice of, of the right language to, uh, to win or some victories that is very important. So I think that we need to change the political uh, strategies and connect with legal strategies. So is what I think. And I asked about uh, looking at other countries as an example, just because I think it's so easy for us to be focused just on what's going on in America. Like, America is banning trans people from the military, like, ah, uh, but not like looking at the rest of the world and seeing these patterns. And um, because we're all connected in that way too, and we're all taking like pages from each other's playbooks. And 
I just wonder if anybody has any consent about like how uh, these movements are connected. Maybe uh, Tatiana, since you've worked in multiple countries. Yeah, for sure. I actually wanted to, to speak to Mexico, though, um, because um, I think that, uh, especially as, as queer folks in the US, I think it's uh, really important for us uh, to be in uh, solidarity and to join uh, the movement um, around immigrants' rights. Um, and you know, this pride, um, in, in the beginning of June, uh, there was a trans woman who died in an ICE detention center uh, last year in June. There was also another trans woman who died in an ICE detention center. Um, there's a discussion now, a national discussion now about you know, um, are are these are the, the detention centers concentrated? Are they a form of concentration camps? I think that, and I, and and I think that the, the issue is that what's happening at the at the border, what's happening, um, is absolutely brutal. With the the recent migrant caravan, the first people, and and I think it's it is um, an LGBT issue. Um, immigrants' rights is an LGBT issue. Um, the first migrants in the migrant caravan that got to the border um, were were queer. Right. Um, then, and and uh, I mean, we were just talking about recently about how there's um, you know there's a lot of uh, queer folks who are uh, seeking asylum and um, and are absolutely brutalized in U.S. detention centers. And so um, I think that those kinds of connections, especially coming from the U.S., um, that is you know a global superpower, what the U.S. does. Um, matters in the rest of the world. Um, I think it's really important for us to have that kind of global perspective, um, and particularly uh, with with Mexico. Does anybody have something to add to that? You have you have experience, didn't you visit the center? I did. Yes. Can you tell us about that? Um, yes, I went down the border uh, visiting the migrant shelters. And I visited the only LGBTQ shelter in Mexico, which um, uh, I'm, I'm Jewish, so I'm going to get a Holocaust reference. Um, when you go to visit Holocaust um, camps, it's just rows of bunk beds, three high, just rows. And um, I was having flashbacks to that because there's these homes that should be, that would have been condemned in America just with bunk beds, rows high, going down the wall. and. Um, multiple people per bunk. And hearing people's stories from um, South America, I was saying earlier that um, the language they use I thought was so telling to describe their sexuality, they might say, my affinity, or just because of who I am and who I, who I know I am, as a way to describe being trans. And um, language, we can argue about like, the function of labels, but, um, it's necessary to let you to let someone know that they're not like alone in their experience of whatever they're feeling has a name. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Pride. It's the anniversary of Stonewall. By the way, has anyone heard that? Fifty years? <laughs> crazy. <laughs> crazy. Um, the police recently put out an apology for the Stonewall raid and. A panelist of ours, Tatiana, wrote an article saying that she does not accept the police's apology. Do you mind explaining why? Yeah, Stonewall was a riot against the cops. <laughs> and um, yeah, I wrote, I wrote an article about it. Um, and now everything's fine with cops, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> love them? Not, no. We don't love them. <laughs> okay. Don't no. show I, I mean, I don't, I, you know. Um, no, I mean, I, I wrote an article about it because, uh, to me, it, it, I think, and coming back to this discussion about the rise of the right and things like that, I think that, you know, um, when we think about queer folks in this context, and especially in the U.S. context, we, you know, we have to really think about it. Like, Trump tweeted support for pride, you know, and Joe Biden was at Stonewall, like, three days ago. Um, and the police said, um, you know, yeah, that maybe that what the thing we did that day was not so good, um, and and the truth is that it was um, it's not a thing they did that day. Um, it was uh, decades of brutalizing uh, queer people, uh, in, in entrapment, um, sexual violence um, in prisons, um, and and not in, in not in prisons in, in, in the bars. 
Um, and, uh, you know, no, a 30 second apology doesn't cut it. And also, if you apologize, that means you intend to change. And the NYPD uh, does not intend to change. Uh, just a few weeks ago, a trans woman died in solitary confinement here in New York City. Uh, so no, I, I don't accept their apology. Um, you know, Eric Garner's uh, murder uh, is, you know, walking around free. Uh, just last month, also, um, they were having a, 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 case, a like a court case to decide not if he would go to jail or not, but rather if he would be able to keep his job as a police officer. And that's the thing; like the cops can can murder black people with you know, a completely free, free reign to do that um, in New York City. Uh, the NYPD um, took away the piers, for example, and the piers were a place where queer folks of color used to go and hang out. Um, and, uh, I mean, the, the, the NYPD, uh, you know, were, were the folks who, who took that away. Um, you know, obviously with, with orders from the government, um, from the governor, Mayor, but um, so no, I, I, I don't accept that apology. And I think that we need to reclaim the radical legacy of Stonewall, um, the fact that it was a riot against, against the cops. The cops were still not on the side of the overwhelming majority of queer people. And we often forget that because for someone who looks like me, like I am cool with cops, right? They're not going to pull me over. Um, I'm haunted by like the video that came up recently of Sandra Bland. Like that's not an anomaly that happens. But opening it up to these other countries, like is it the same experience with the queer community and minority communities and the police as well? Oh, in Mexico we didn't have a um, Stonewall. Yeah. But actually this uh, international day against homophobia, lesbophobia, and transphobia, uh, our president was is the first president who took a picture with the rainbow flag. And for many activists say that it's very great to have this picture for the first time in our story. But I say that we don't need a pictures. We need specific things, specific change. So if we are fighting for uh, our rights for trans identity, for centers marriage, it's what we need. We don't need a picture. So some of us, we don't accept that picture, if I want to say in some similar thing. Because uh, trans people are dying, are continue dying in, in, in Mexico. Uh, in some states, uh, don't have the right to get married, something like that. So we need another kind of actions, not just pictures, is what I could say. Andreas, what about the relationship between the police and the queer community in Germany? Um, but Germans are not, not so good in resistance, uh, so that's not their strength, so they try to, to convince uh, people. And there has been uh, a lot of uh, problems and raids, of course, when homosexuality was still illegal. Um, that's not my time, I cannot talk about that. But, uh, of course, the, the police um, in a tendency is uh, always a bit more conservative and a bit more to the right than the average of the society. It's also a bit a fault of the leftists because leftists don't, do not tend to join the police. That's a problem. Uh, and um, so you have uh, um, not so much uh, homophobic or trans transphobic, yes, but not so much homophobic uh, accidents, but a lot of xenophobic accidents, for instance, uh, with police. Uh, but it's always possible to address that, and uh, a lot of, of uh, civil rights groups and, and, and grassroots movements try to do that, and more or less are also six. Well, are not totally unsuccessful, let's say. <laughs> So, but uh, yeah, the structural problem is, is uh, in, in, in armed organizations like the police is, is given, but that is a structural problem. And then while we're talking about pride, Puebla, I'm coming to you. 
what Stonewall was an uprising, you know, or the history of it as a revolt. Now um, it's arguable if we have that same attitude, you know, as Carly and Brad Jackson plays. Um, what is the purpose and function of Pride then? Wait up. You're, you're tossing that to me. I said your name. You did. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I, uh, living PST moments, because I'm old enough to, well, I mean, Sex Garage was, uh, I lived police brutality. I felt that and, for and real. Just for people who don't know, that was your Stonewall Canada-ish, right? For a generation. For a generation of people, there's an argument in, in Montreal that trucks in 1977, when cops uh, raided a gay bar with assault rifles, uh, for that generation, that's their Stonewall. And for a generation that was more diverse in 1990, uh, Sex Garage um, is when they raided this after hours or this, um, this let rave. And different communities came together and, uh, and protested. Um, what is Pride today? What's the purpose and the function? I don't know what it is today. Um, we're here, we're queer, and you know, and we're still around. Um, you know, when we founded Diversité in 1993, it was about giving voice to the disenfranchised and to the marginalized. And uh, at that time, you know, Certainly banks wanted nothing to do with us and governments didn't want to have anything to do with us. Beer companies wanted to have something to do with us. They'd give us beer and we'd have to sell it and then, you know, but, um, uh, and in that I think it's become uh, propping up uh, gay white men, uh, propping up capitalism, propping up spending, um, buy your house with TD. Um, I think Pride's become about that. I, I think it's become very corporate. And there's a place for that. I don't think that there's not a place for that. I also think that, and I'm buoyed by, um, what are you calling it here? The, the other Pride? The other reclaiming Pride? pride. Like um, I'm buoyed by that because I see I see a new gen a generation coming up and going. Uh-uh, that's that's not what we're about. We're about something else, um, and that excites me. Um, and I'm coming back next week and kind of tittering on both sides uh, of uh, because I think it's it's really fascinating to see what that generation of resistance is going to bring. But I don't know, uh, we'll see, I mean, what they have to bring in terms of pride. And you don't have to know. That's great. Thank I you. don't know. We're going to go down the line. Alex, you're next. Well, I don't have an answer again. <laughs> but I think that for us in Mexico, pride is the new way to say I'm resisting. Um, when I said the pride in, OK, we have a big pride in Mexico City. Uh, if you have a, if you live in another state and you have enough money to travel, you can enjoy the pride, right? But if you don't have it, what is your pride? No, it's the question maybe. Um, when I start to represent some couples to wanted to get married, the pride is the way to say I'm resisting that law in the case of Oaxaca. So. Uh, for trans people, maybe pride is I'm um, resisting that um, institution that doesn't don't doesn't want to give me my document. So I think our pride in Mexico is not the pride like uh, if uh, in the next week to in Mexico City. I think the pride is a new way to say I'm resisting, and we are resisting many things. Depends of our own situation in Mexico City, because it's not the same living in Mexico City than living in Oaxaca, in Chiapas, uh, in Chihuahua. So pride uh, could have many uh, meanings, I think. That's great, thank you. 
Uh, we had the debate about the com commercialization of the, of the Pride uh, in Berlin in the beginning of the 90s already. Um, when uh, people say exactly the same thing, we don't want to have uh, huge disco trucks without any political demand on, on, a, on a Pride. Uh, I think Germany is the only country where the Pride is not called Pride, but Christopher Street Day. Uh, and um, so, uh, and we had uh, for some years in the 90s, we had also two prides in Berlin. The one was uh, the more or less official, and the other one was the alternative. And the, the alternative had always the slogan Stonewall was a riot. Um, so, Stonewall was as influential to you in Germany as it was here? I am not, you know, I wasn't around at the, at the, at the very moment, but uh, in, the, in the tradition, yeah. It, has quite a lot of influence in the, uh, on it. We will have a panel in Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung tomorrow at 7 p.m. <laughs> about the connection between uh, Stonewall and the West German uh, LGBT movement. So who is interested to hear about that? Yeah, kindly invite it. Sorry for this. <laughs> no, no. Um, yeah, I think it, is, it was influential for, for, the, for the movement, especially in West Germany, not so much in East Germany. We always have to talk about two different traditions in, in this, in this uh, question. Thank you. Um, I think that what's happened to Pride, um, to me, is uh, really interesting to think about, to study, to understand the way that our society works, the way that capitalism has this power to just co-opt things, right? Um, I mean, Stonewall was a riot against the police. That's what it was. You know, it was, uh, you know, these trans women of color throwing shit at the cops, you know? Um, it was, and, and not just trans women of color, right? Like, other queer folks who were, who were at Stonewall that day. Um, it was a I mean, it was like the lowest of the low at the, you know, the, 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 the most marginal sectors of society that organized a riot in the middle of New York City for four days, you know? That's what Stonewall was. It's crazy, you know, that that happened. And now you look at Pride and it's like, here's the police contingent and here's Starbucks. And by the way, Starbucks, you know, with all of their like Rainbow Gear is are right now in court because they're defending a transphobic manager against a trans woman who is suing them, <laughs> um, and and so these corporations they don't they don't give a shit you know about um, about the lowest of the low that are still you know trans women of color um, working class queer folks you know and um, what and and don't get me wrong like I'm glad that. Um, that, that there's more acceptance of queer people. I want that, you know? I don't want us to die on the margins. I don't, I don't want that. Um, but I also think that there's a way that, um, that you know, that, that, that it's our, our movement has been so co-opted um, and, and yet, you know, there's still people that are incredibly marginalized in the queer community that are of color, that are, work, that are working class, that are trans, um, and, uh, yeah, and, and the march doesn't doesn't represent that. Doesn't represent the roots of what Stonewall was. Um, I, I'm going to contradict myself a little bit because I'm, I actually was around at the tail end of the '70s and early '80s when queer men weren't at the heads of companies, and if they were, they were deeply closeted. They were in service industries. They were generally poor. And if they were out at all, were, were ostracized. So I also think that uh, part of this is not just being co-opted, but then there's queers that become, uh, go into positions of power and, you know, and bring their corporations in to get involved. I don't think it's just, it's, it's, I don't think it's all co-opting. I think there's actual growth in terms of like people making gains from our community and trying to get their companies. Yes, nothing's perfect, and yes, like, the horror stories are, are numerous, but I also think it's an evolution of where some of us have gone. 
because now I think, you know, uh, indigenous people in, in, in my country, uh, people of color, trans, I mean, that's, that's, the next, that's the next wave of like propping up. But I, I just don't think it's like capitalism run amok with pride. I also think it's community rising. And like all of that just reminds me of like virtue signaling, which happens all the time online now. Um, you know, citing trans women of color being killed in the South and the HIV rates of black men, which is like, you know, every, like, it's 50%. Um, it, and then, like, inaction. How many Instagram posts have you read that shout out Marsha and Sylvia, but what is the action that they're taking? And, um, do you have a question? No, I just, I'm trying to understand what you're I'm just thinking of, like, talk versus action. Like, what needs to be done to get people to, um, to do, get, do an action, to, you know, support activism with more than just their words. Can I answer? Um, when we start to, to organize legal strategy, we start to change the focus of the attention for the strategies because uh, actually me, I, uh, I, when I was in Oaxaca, I thought that uh, nobody could happen without uh, to convince the government or the Congress. And when I start to connect my rights directly with uh, the Constitution, I said, as a lawyer, um, and I discovered that I don't need for some things to convince to the Congress, and all one Congress of the government is different. So when we apply this with uh, the couples that want to get married, it's the same thing. So we learned that our rights uh, don't necessarily have to connect with the political parties, with uh, institutions in the government or in the Congress. So connecting with what that Jenna is saying, um, I think that we have new standards nowadays in many parts of our country. With a new what? New standards. Oh. I think in every bow that every couple um, one with the in the court to get married. I think for us it's like a stonewall in these scenarios where there are more discrimination than Mexico City. So it's just not one stonewall I think. So maybe we have one stonewall every day for many different people or for many different groups of in of the country. So maybe it's a different meaning for the stonewall but um, I think it's happening now. Do you something to add, Tatiana? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I wanted to say, uh, just to, to speak to what, what you were saying about, um, you know, there being, um, you know, gay CEOs. And there are. There are gay CEOs. Um, and uh, I think that, to me, it really shows the sort of uh, limits of uh, representation, you know? That having one or two tokens ascend to the highest positions it actually, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily trickle down, you know? And, um, and that's, that's what, you know, why I keep pointing to capitalism, because I think that that's actually the nature of the system that we live in, right? Where there's a few people who live super well, mm -hmm. and uh, now some of them can be openly gay. Um, and, uh, but, but for the rest of us, you know, I mean, it's kind of shitty, <laughs> you know? It's actually, from ranging from kind of shitty to incredibly shitty, right? And so, and I think that that's the nature of the the, the system that we live in. And I think that what's happened to um, the LGBT movement really uh, exemplifies that in a super clear way, I think. Um, and then in terms of what we can do in terms of activism, um, I mean, I am, I think that, um, you know, not relying on or expecting that the politicians that also represent the capitalist system, you know, not thinking that they're gonna fix it for us is really important, you know? So I was really heartened by, um, you know, when, um, when the Muslim ban happened and people went to the airports and, uh, you know, and, and people were like, nah, we're like, 
this isn't going to happen because we're here, you know? Or really heartened by, um, you know, when the government shutdown was happening and the airline workers were like, we're going on strike, and then they were like, oh, no, open the government, <laughs> you know? Um, like, the airline workers opened open the government, you know? And so I, I think that um, sometimes we don't know how powerful we are, you know? We don't know how powerful we are when we organize in the streets, um, and we certainly don't often, especially in the U.S., don't know how powerful we are when we go on strike, and because we, we we're able to shut the whole thing down, you know, <laughs> you know that that's how the government shutdown ended. You know, the the airline workers were like, we're going to shut down New York City airports, and they were like, oh, can't do that, you know, um, and you know that what what was went on for thirty days was over right away, and so I think that um, we're really powerful, and I think that there is. I think that we're beginning to awaken to that power in the U.S. Uh, with, you know, for example, the teacher strike wave and, and things like that. As we start to near the end, I think that is an amazing place to take it, which is how, if people want to get more involved, if they want to become an activist who can sit on a panel on stage, if they just are wondering where to start, what do we recommend? Where though? Um, you know, like, if a queer kid, a party kid, could end up, like, organizing one of the biggest Pride events, and it, our event wasn't actually called Pride, it was called Diversité, it was about diversity, um, and by the way, that name was, we got slagged for that, diversity, what the hell is that? This was in 1993, and now it's kind of this thing. Just do, just do, do it in your community, just uh, campus radio, community radio, podcasts. It costs, you know, very little money to put equipment together to do a podcast. Uh, find your voice. It's very your challenging, voice. okay? It's very challenging. Pardon? It's very challenging, don't hurt me. <laughs> he has a podcast. <laughs> but but no, but sorry. like, I, I think, it doesn't take a lot. It just takes do it first in your in your circle of people and in your family. And and if you have grander ambitions, you know, join the center. Join uh, Rainbow Railroad. Rainbow Railroad is this organization that that helps. Uh, you guys seem to know. Yeah. <laughs> um, the Rainbow Railroad is based on a railroad uh, that was in World War II that would help um, what's immigrants and uh, what's the word? Somebody senior moment I'm having. Um, we've been talking about it this evening, saving people who are being persecuted in their countries. Refugees. Um, refugees, thank you, refugees. You know, join an organization, join the center. It's so simple, really. Andreas, what do you think? My recommendation would be just look around you and ask yourself what is which thing you see that is not as it should be concerns you most, and then start pulling on this thread and look around and, and uh, search and Google who is working on that too <laughs> <laughs> and join them, and you will uh, find out if this is the right place to be or not, and if not, then look for another place. Where we have those amazing young people who are going out every Friday for Friday, the Fridays for Future. I don't know if this happens here as well, but in Europe it's a huge thing. People do, do, uh, students don't go to school on Friday, but go to demonstration for climate. Or we have people in the neighborhood uh, fighting a new high rise, which is uh, shadowing the, the whole neighborhood. Or be it uh, supporting. LGBT refugees uh, and help them to, to find their roots in, in this country. Alex. Okay. Mm, I was thinking what to say this because uh, Mexico is a big country and how can I say to someone who lives in Oaxaca or in Nuevo León or Chihuahua but I agree with Andreas that always there is someone always together. So we just need to look around. Uh, maybe there is not a, a specific LGBT movement or organization, 
but we need to start with or dialogue with other movements. Maybe there is an organization for immigrants or for a feminist organization, I don't know. So we need to start that we are only one movement, a bigger movement against the same things that are fighting for our freedom in the world, not just in Mexico or in another country. So just look around and someone will stay there for us. So that's what I want to say. Thanks. Tatiana, the person in the audience who is like, damn, she's cool. How do I feel like her? <laughs> Where is that? Um, so I think that there's two things. I think that we have to um, engage in activism, and I think that um, that means taking the streets. Um, that means, uh, yeah, so, so I think we have to engage in activism and, and not rely on capitalist politicians. Um, so I think that that's really important. But I don't think that that's um, enough because, um, like I said at the beginning, I don't want to just resist, I want to win. And by winning, I mean I want, I want socialism. You know, I want to, I want, and, um, and, I, and I want a system in which, um, you know, in, in which we can end this horrible system of exploitation. I want a planet that has a future. Um, and I, uh, yeah, and, and I want to end uh, the oppression of, uh, you know, people of color, queer folks, uh, women. And, um, and so I think that the ideas really matter. The vision of where we're going matters. So I think sometimes like burnout happens because people are kind of spinning their wheels and you're not really sure where you're going. Um, and so to me, um, you know, I, um, I think ideas matter. I think theory matters. I think that there's a lot of people who thought a lot about um, how to end capitalism. And I think that uh, we, we can stand on their shoulders. The net, you know, the US really tried to um, erase that history in the 90s. Um, it's tried to erase that history a lot. Um, but those ideas are really powerful, and so I think that uh, a combination of, of activism and ideas, um, to me, is the way forward. Um, the, the plug um, <laughs> would be, uh, I write for a, a website called Left Voice, and we're always, you know, uh, open to contributors and uh, to discuss politics with folks, and I'm also in the Socialist Feminist Working Group of the DSA. Um, that are also, you know, we do reading groups, we do activism, things like that. So in New York City, those are some of the things that I'm up to. Because there are many groups people can join. Yes, there are many groups. <laughs> you don't need to reinvent the wheel. It <laughs> exists. Just push it. <laughs> Does that have anybody have anything to add before we turn to questions? Anything burning? Does anybody in the audience have a question? Yes, what's up? Hi. Um, Um, and kind of the, the main kind of point that I hear a lot of, you know, queer communism has kind of tried to push is that, oh, cis -heter, you know, cis heteropatriarchy was created by to kind of control the working class and to kind of, you know, push for the reproduction of labor power and the reproduction of the relations, of, you know, all that stuff. Um, but then, you know, there's the whole other thing which says, oh, but like if you look at industrialization, that kind of allowed for a kind of an, abolish, an abolition of the nuclear family in order because, you know, so many people were leaving cottage industries and going into, you know, factories and kind of these, you know, metropolitan centers. Um, and I just wonder, you know, so I was just kind of wondering, like, is, would you kind of say that there was kind of a direct moment where kind of, um, homophobia or anti-queer violence and capitalism kind of intertwine like there because I'm thinking like kind of how white supremacy and capitalism intertwine in the prim in the primitive accumulation of the Atlantic slave trade you know that's like kind of like a historical moment where you can directly trace when those two kind of both birthed each other kind of in a way so just wondering just kind of a bit of a nerdy question but it fascinates me <laughs> Easy questions. <laughs> 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 like, what the hell, man? <laughs> um, 
Okay, I'm gonna try. <laughs> um, so I'm actually trying to write an article about this right now, so bear with me. I think um, John D'Amelio has a great text about this. Um, also, I recently translated a text um, by a Trotskyist in France called Jean Nicolas um, that, that is also quite good and takes this up. Um, my understanding is that, um, you know, obviously, um, like, there's been a diversity of, like, you know, same sex sex, of uh, gender identities throughout history. Um, and it, it, sometimes they have been, and they've been disciplined in different kinds of ways in different kinds of societies, right? Um, in the, you know, prior to, you know, in the emergence of capitalism, um, there's a criminalization of acts, not necessarily identities. The, the argument that John D'Amelio makes, which I think to me makes sense, is that um, the identity of uh, being gay or lesbian is um, emergence with, the, with capitalism, um, with uh, the divorcing of reproduction and production, um, sorry, this is really specific. <laughs> um, We're following, it's fine. Okay, <laughs> this is really. Okay, so with the divorcing, you know, like in feudalism, like the family did all the things, right? And now in capitalism, like you can like go, like you, like if you can go live somewhere else and you can even like, you know, maybe go to, like you don't have to necessarily, if you're a dude and you have a job and you don't necessarily have to get married, and whatever. So. So capitalism sort of allows for the opening of that possibility, but also very violently represses that possibility, right? And so, I mean, and I think that that's interesting because as Marxists, that's kind of what we think capitalism does, right? Capitalism creates the conditions for our liberation. It creates the conditions for socialism. But and I also think that capitalism, you know, create, like it opens the possibilities, um, but also closes them, you know, um, in the ways that, that I was talking about in the presentation. So that, I tried. <laughs> Thank you. In the back. Oh, wait, wait did you have a response? I just oh, back. <laughs> uh, I, I don't have to add much, but I don't have to add anything because it was brilliant how you explained it. But uh, just, just because I also was uh, 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 once in a, a Marxist feminist organization, I just want to warn before the idea, or warn of the idea, that uh, once capitalism is uh, overcome, all those homophobia, transphobia, and all this stuff is also at the same time overcome. That was in a time in Marxism and uh, an argumentation that those are side contradictions of the main contradiction. That will not happen. Can I say something else about that? Yeah. I have more things to say. Um, yeah, I actually think that um, it's really central that any sort of socialist movement take up issues of oppression, not as a side note, not as a, you know, but that, no, nah, it's, it's central. Um, and, you know, I have comrades, for example, in Argentina that, um, and I think I tell the story because I think it's a beautiful example. Um, they were working in this, um, they were working in this factory uh, that is like a print shop. and. Um, they, uh, and one of the workers came out as, as trans, and the manager didn't want to call her by her name, and they didn't want to let her use the bathroom, the, the women's bathroom. And uh, we had some comrades in that factory, and they were in the leadership of the union, and um, they put up a fight with their coworkers, you know, to take this issue up. And they ended up going on strike um, to defend their trans coworker, and um, you know, three hours later, the managers like actually don't care about this that much. Like, fine, <laughs> you know. Um, and and um, and she got to use the bathroom, and the, and the manager called her by her name. And um, a year later, um, that factory got shut down, and those workers they took over the factory um, and put it under worker control. And I think to, and 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 they'll tell you that um, the fact that they put up that fight for their coworker um, helped strengthen them to a year later take over that factory. And so um, I completely reject the idea that, that these are separate struggles. Um, they're not. Uh, when we fight for the most oppressed amongst us, the working class is stronger. 
Um, and when we sell out the most oppressed amongst us, um, we are weaker, right? Um, and so, so I, yeah, I, I think that, yeah. That's also just coalition building, which is what exactly Alex was describing in marriage equality in Mexico. That this will make us stronger and fight for the next thing. Just want to connect those dots. In the back, we got a question. Yes, thank you all so much. Uh, I'm wondering, it's all hard work, right? So what do you, why do you keep doing it? What keeps you going? And is that your favorite thing about you? Okay. Alex. Uh, it's a very good question that I have made by myself many times. But I discovered, it's my opinion, that my story, my personal story, didn't start when I was born. I'm a part of a bigger story that uh, start before to me and will continue when I died. So it's the reason because I'm doing this. So I just like a part of a big story, a big fight against uh, the oppression and it's my is what I need to do to have like an, a reason to exist uh, because I don't want that other people uh, pass the same thing that uh, we, we live every day in some moments on our lives, the violence, discrimination, and many other things. Uh, but the meaning is yeah, that. I learned that my story start before that I was born and that will continue even when I die. That's a beautiful answer. Thank you. You said I said no. You don't have to say anything. You don't want me to say anything? No, you don't have to. Do you uh, want to? I mean, no. Um, now, um, I mean, if, if you're passionate, I am passionate about the stuff that I do, so it doesn't feel like work. I feel like if I'm passionate about something, if I believe about something enough, it's, it's not hard work. Um, now, um, I, I write plays and I write monologues and I play for audiences and that's how I contribute now. Um, um, and that's perfect for me, but it's not hard work. It's fun. You get to, you get to meet interesting people, you get to be challenged, you get to challenge. Um, yeah. I think I, I'm in an incredibly privileged situation as a white man from Germany uh, having the opportunity to work, to work in, in New York and I, I think, I feel I, I have the obligation to give something back. That's basically it. That's great. You just want to add? I don't have to. I think too, like, how could you not be absolutely irate about, uh, before we were saying something? Tatiana mentioned that in Brazil, the average life expectancy of trans women is 27. In the US, it's 35. And um, it like made my eyes like glaze over. So I think it's like, if you are keeping up to date on things, like how could you not be angry AF? Was there one more question? Sold. Thank you so much for being here to the panel. Let's give a round of applause. And thanks for coming. Bye.